when my fear is crippling you are true you are true even in my wondering you are joy you are joy you're the reason that i see you are life you are life in you death is lost its sting to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever
all around the room right now can we just settle in on a few things because what I see in this worship team I've seen it in them for a while but I feel it so much tonight is there's such an anchor in the presence of the Lord it's their anchor it's what they come from and the Lord is just stirring me with you know, it's some of the things that anchor us is the very things that cause us to sail. I'll, I'll give you an example. How many believe there's power in the name of Jesus? Now listen to that. That's an anchoring thought, is it not? But doesn't it at the same time want you to kick your uh, chair over because you're just ready to take off? There's power in the name of Jesus that is my anchor and at the same time it's what sets me to sail how many believe there's power in the blood of Jesus so what he did what he did on that cross is electrifying us now how many believe he's not in the grave anymore but he is risen so anchoring and at the same time we're launching out into that because of those anchoring anchoring things in our hearts and in our faith now with those anchors in place I want you to just consider something with me in this room today with those anchors in place can your situations that you're facing tonight stand can they stand in the uh, face of the blood of Jesus, of the name of Jesus, and th uh, do you any harm or threaten you or put you in a corner? Absolutely not. But sometimes we need to anchor so we can sail. So this, we have one of those moments right now. If you would, with eyes closed right now, if you've got, if you've got things going on in your life that just make you feel like your ship, your ship is getting tossed every which way, it's hard for me to focus in tonight in worship because, man, I've got so many things that are trying to toss my ship every which way. Somebody needs to hear tonight. There's power in the name of Jesus. And he's empowered your lips to speak his name over that situation and into that situation in a way that causes that ship to sink and ours to sail father we rest right now every life that's represented here we're resting right now in the anchors that you've given us lord to those that are seeking direction here tonight and i do sense that that there are those that have come here tonight that are saying i've got to see my next place i'm tired of just going okay I'm just trying to be faithful and I'm just trying to hold on until I figure out what happens next but Lord there's those here tonight that I, I, I can sense I just know there are those here tonight that are seeking direction and I just want to encourage you here tonight that it's not you're not going to find that direction because you evaluate all of the circumstances once again <laughs> because you pro and con those things once again no 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 but the Lord says go ahead and lay in and just and just allow yourself to be anchored with the things that I've allowed you to be anchored with allow your heart to settle down for a minute and be anchored in the things that I've given and for those people right now as you do that as a byproduct, you're going to see that next place tonight. You're going to see, I just need a glimpse, God. Yeah, 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 he's giving it tonight. Allow yourself, your heart to be anchored, your soul to be anchored tonight. And he's going to give a glimpse into that next place as you do.
Father, all over the room. I thank you, Lord, for a revelation, a revelation. Lord, some that have even had, this is what I feel, that some have even had this revelation in the past, but it's gotten buried under so many circumstances and conditions. And he's, and he's awakening once again, Lord, awaken once again to the realities of our anchors. That our heart might rise up and be bold as lions to, to set sail once again and not to be pulled over. Open eyes. Open eyes. Some of you that are looking for direction, I just encourage you to even touch your eyes right now. Open eyes in the name of Jesus. Open eyes in the name of Jesus. Empowered walks, strength to the knees. No more wandering, no more hoping. But Lord, I pray that you use this time right now to set the course once again. Amen? Amen. 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 Hey, if the Lord is doing something in you right now, I just want you to look to the person beside you and say, Isn't God awesome? Amen. He's doing it. He is doing it. Hey, can we, can we just encourage and thank our uh, youth worship team here tonight for the way that they minister to us? I tell you, I really, every time I've been around our teenagers, you really do awesomely get a sense. You know, I, I, I believe they are being taught in worship and they're being taught in hosting the presence of God and you just feel that when they're here and uh, we're, so we're just so thankful uh, for them and, and for what God's doing in their lives. Um, we, uh, we have uh, lots of amazing things that are happening here at the church and I want to mention one of them to you tonight but before we do that, um, uh, could those, yes I see our uh, youth is going to go ahead and go uh, in. Um, our kids club can go ahead and go uh, upstairs as well. Um, our nursery and preschool. Yeah, that's a party right there. It's a big party. Exit easy. Um, but yeah, we want to we worship the Lord in our giving uh, tonight. Um, there are a couple of ways that you can give. Uh, you'll probably notice some envelopes there uh, in front of you in your chairs. Uh, also, we have opportunity of text giving. Um, because we are cool and millennial like that, uh, you can uh, very easy to text your gift to 84321. Uh, so text the number that you want to give to that number. And what it does is it sets a course where it'll ask you for some information. You, get that, you give that uh, credit card information or whatever one time, and that's kind of locked in so that anytime uh, you want to worship uh, in your giving, you can do that. Um, also, uh, you know, checks can be made out, obviously, to ECH. Um, but uh, we want to make opportunity for everybody to participate in that giving. We're, we're, we just know this. We know that the Lord owns it all. Right? We're not under the deception that uh, we keep part, we keep 90% and God gets 10. Uh, what a travesty would that would be. What we recognize is that he owns it all. Amen? And we worship him by saying, hey, we're acknowledging that, that this really isn't mine in my hand. Um, but what really is mine is every need that you supply according to your riches and glory and not to my bank account. Or you can keep, you can keep 90. See how that works out for you. That's the, way the, that's the way the kingdom works. Is we come and we give, he gives all of himself so that we can give all of ourselves. And we call that covenant. And through that covenant, we have awesome blessings that come through that. That's just the way we know. It's just the way we know. So if you're prepared to give, um, I want you to, uh, I'm going to go ahead and play a blessing over that offering, and, and our stewardship team will go ahead and collect that. Father, you are amazing. You are the supplier of good gifts. Father, you are the supplier of all needs. Sometimes I get deceived into thinking that I'm the supplier for my household, but no, no. You are the supplier of all needs of the individuals and the families represented in this room. 
And so, Lord, we do celebrate. We do celebrate that by surrendering all of our hearts to you right now. All of our ideas about how all of this works, we surrender it to you. And we thank you, Father, for a great blessing upon this offering to the furtherance of your kingdom and to the furtherance of uh, and that kingdom being furthered even through the lives of the families represented here. We thank you for that blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I want to mention to you uh, that our no-show uh, is happening. It's our second no-show that we've ever done. How many were a part of our no-show last time? Anybody remember that? We just, we're going to tear down these two sections after church on Sunday um, and uh, set up some tables. So we'd love, your opp- we'd love you to help us out with that. Uh, but we're going to tear down these couple of sections, set up some tables, um, uh, set up a really nice environment here uh, for us to enjoy. Uh, Pastor Pat and uh, Pastor Stephanie have already been working on some things uh, uh, for, to uh, uh, just have fun and entertain us uh, that night. But also we're receiving new members um, uh, that night. I believe we have as many as 15 new members uh, to our church that we're welcoming in that night. So that'll be awesome. Um, uh, but we're going to have a great um, uh, meal together. Um, uh, meat is being supplied. And then uh, what we want is if you have sides or desserts that are your specialties, or even if they aren't your specialty, but you would like to bring that and prepare that, uh, then we welcome you to do that. If you wouldn't mind, go into the Grand Hall after church tonight and uh, jot down, give us your name and jot down what side or dessert you want to bring. That way we know that we're getting, uh, we'll have the uh, main course, and then we're having everybody's bringing mashed potatoes. Um, <laughs> you know, just uh, if we could help and coordinate that way, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, uh, really excited about the uh, teaching here tonight. So, Pastor Kevin, come join us. Let's, let's open this thing up. I need to tell you this, uh, though, the ones that uh, do know, uh, we had this past week, or yesterday actually, um, Winston Short, husband of Linda, you guys probably know him from the door right over there, good friends of ours, and um, passed away, had leukemia, and it hit him, uh, was detected probably less than a month ago, and uh, uh, passed away yesterday. Very peaceful passing, um, but the arrangements are as follows. Friday at 11, from 11 to 1, the viewing at, in, at Bailey's, Funeral home in Flatwoods, Kentucky, and one o'clock will be the service. So, we're going to be doing a bereavement dinner for the family in Flatwoods. So, those of you that could see Pam maybe after service, if you um, are not on Facebook, and we're going to put out a request for uh, some some items that we can feed the whole family after uh, the funeral, and uh, I'll be doing the, the service. And after service, we'll, uh, after the service, we'll be feeding the family and having fellowship with them. Linda's doing uh, well, as, you know, as, as can be expected in the midst of this. So uh, she's a strong lady, but uh, these kind of things happen. And um, thank God that you know, Winston was one of the most humble uh, people that I'd ever met in my life. 80, 81 years old and uh, just an incredible man of God. Uh, great integrity. Um, I remember we found a picture today of you, you and Linda and Ernie and him. We were in March of 2016 walking this place when all we had was beams and beams weren't even in the right place. And we were walking through here praying. We had a prayer meeting here pretty regularly. And Winston and Linda and Ernie were standing there and Lisa captured the picture. And uh, we've got that. Boy, it was a moment three years ago, almost to the day that we were here uh, praying. And we would not be in this building if it wasn't for for Winston. There's no question about it in so many ways. Uh, but he was a great encourager. We were right in the middle of this project and gosh, it was just overwhelming with pressure and trying to meet deadlines and financial deadlines and all this. And him and Linda came walking in one day and I was walking through right there in that hallway. And uh, the, they said, gosh, slow down for a minute. I see your face. It was all over me. And they said, take a breath. This is going to be okay. And uh, somehow, it just enough, uh, instilled enough confidence in me that moment just to take a breath, a, a breath and let it know it was going to be okay. And it was okay. And here we are today. So those are the kind of things that he is so instrumental in being a part of this church. So I want you, um, if you can, to see Pam at the end of service. 
uh, if you're able to do something, a dessert, whatever. I don't, she'll have a list, I'm sure, or at least give you some coaching on what's, what we're going to do for them on Sunday or Friday after the funeral service, okay? Tonight, um, how many of you have read your scriptures? Did y'all read the scriptures? Um, yeah. Scare you to death? No? Well, we're going to open this up a little bit. Um, I'm going to go to Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. It'll be the first passage. But let me kind of preface this by saying this. I'm not here to, I'm not trying to scare us. I'm not trying to throw us off balance. That is not my intent at all. Um, I've always had this desire to go just a little bit deeper in the word. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a why guy. And so when you, you, someone tells you something that just, okay, that's just the way it's always been, I'm the kind of guy that says, well, why is that? Uh, I, wanna, I wanna get the understanding behind just being able to repeat it. Does that make sense? So we want to dig a little deeper and look a little deeper because I'm convinced that we are packing, carrying by the power of the Holy Spirit through the name of Jesus, we are packing the greatest power the universe could ever possibly imagine. Would you all agree with that? And that great power by the Holy Spirit is not just external, outside of us. If he come to live in us, there's something inside of us that has to be more than be able to quote the scripture that says greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's got to become more than a confidence booster when you're going through a tough time. It's got to become a reality, a living reality, where your perception and the lens and view of you see through God and life is a reality that you live from. And I'm only trying to get us to just bump up against some things that hopefully... um, It'll make us explore and have a desire for the word even more. Um, I've always been somebody that just dives in the word. And I, and I wanna, want you guys to be the same way, but I know how you, you, you develop a craving for it by the more you read it, right? The more questions you have. God is mysterious, and we're not gonna answer all these questions, but I am confident in this one thing. I'm confident that the Holy Spirit is the teacher. Amen. See that? I got a witness. And out of the mouth of two or three, we got a word established. Um, I'm confident the Holy Spirit is a teacher. And he will teach you. And he guides you. And he reminds you and brings things to your remembrance that relate to the word, which is Jesus. Right? So I'm going to break some things down tonight, ask some questions, um, challenge us. Um, going to, it might take me a couple of weeks to do this, but I'm going to get as far as I can tonight. But I don't want to just get through the material to say I got through the material. I want it to be thorough, and I want it to work the muscles that we need to work, right? Mm-hmm. Challenge what needs to be challenged. So let me read this passage of script. Let's do the King James Version, NIV. I'm not sure it's from heaven, but let's go into the... I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I read the NIV too, but there's some, there are some discrepancies there, okay? Um, y'all figure that out on your own. Let's do the King, New King James. Uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 1, verse through 12. You're right, you're right on it. If we just get the New King James, we're fine. How about the New King James? These and thou's just don't apply today. Not tonight, anyway. Well, I want us to get the, the, nut, the, the, the nuggets of the scripture. I don't want us to get caught up in the language. Okay, ready? And again, he entered Capernaum, speaking of Jesus, after some days. And I want to go really slow tonight. Probably seems a little drawn out, but I'm doing this for own benefit. And it was heard that he... Jesus was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them. There was just so many people in this, this house that there was not enough, you couldn't get another person in the house. Not even near the door. There couldn't even be anybody squeezing through the door. So the door was blocked off. And he preached the word, here we go. He preached the word to them. It wasn't that he just got a sermon. Can I stop right there for a minute? He didn't just get a sermon. He preached the word to them. He is the word. He was, when he gathered people together to preach and teach, he spoke of himself. Right? And he spoke of himself in relation to the Father. Make sense? It wasn't like today where we'd get away and study for a couple of hours to get a sermon to illustrate to some people. No, he was in a house full of people that couldn't get pressed in. Any more people come in, and he spoke of himself. He preached. The reason he preached, he didn't teach, it says. He preached. 
because he was preaching to get them to believe. Remember, teaching you learn, preaching you believe. So he was getting them to, he was preaching the word, him, to them. Next verse. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they actually took off the roof and come through the roof. They let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, whoo, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak? See, he was speaking, preaching the word to them, but the scribes are still referring to him as this man. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Here, this is powerful. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic. I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Next verse says, immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of all of them, so that all were amazed and glorified. God gets gets glory by the doing, saying, we never saw anything like this. Let me break this down for us. This is one, Mark chapter two. We've always been taught, or I've been taught, I mean, I say we've all, I've been taught, and I've had a perception that my view of God is it requires... Um, me to have a, a, a level of faith to receive anything from the Lord, right? That's been my perception. It's been my understanding. And not that that's wrong, and I'm not going to say anything that I've been taught has been wrong. I'm just concerned maybe I'm a little bit incomplete. Would that be fair to say? I'm looking for the completion and the fulfillment of those promises, not just knowing the promises, Right? So I've always had been taught and always preached and always really kind of leaned into people and imposed on people that it takes a certain level of faith to receive anything from God. I believe that's true. I'm not saying that's not true. What I'm saying is this in this story, Jesus was preaching and believing the word in this ha- to the pre- believe, preaching the word to these people in this house. There was no more room to get in this place. Four guys take off the roof because whether the people in the house believed him or not wasn't the issue. Those guys believed or they wouldn't have taken off the roof, right? So they were desperate to get this guy in because there was something inside of them that knew if they get him in his presence, something's going to change in his paralytic's life, right? They didn't care it was on the Sabbath day. The next verse talks about it being on the Sabbath day. They didn't care it was on the Sabbath They didn't care what the people thought. They weren't looking for a formula. They weren't looking for a template. All they knew is Jesus was not just a written word. He was the word of God. He was a man. He was a being, a person, right? He had an ability to be touched by by these people. So it wasn't like he was distant from them and they would go, well, maybe it'll happen. They knew if they could get that paralytic inside of that house in his presence, he would heal that man. What they didn't know was when Jesus was standing there, these people bring this paralytic down on the bed. There's four guys carrying him. Jesus looks at them and says, looks at the man and says, your sins are forgiven. That man never asked for his sins to be forgiven. How does that fit to your current theology? Can a man be forgiven that didn't ask to have his sins forgiven? Now, we can say it this way to help us a little bit. I'm going to push on this a little bit, but because I'm pushing on myself right now, too. As we move into, it makes me feel a little bit better to say, well, they had the faith to see him heal, so they had, he, he said, your sins are forgiven. The scribes looked at him and said this, 
in their heart. They looked at him, they were perceiving in their heart. Who, he's blaspheming. Who, who does he think he is? There is only God can forgive sins, right? Jesus perceived in his heart what they had perceived in their heart, and he, just, he discerned. And when he discerned, he asked them the question, is it not easy or as easy? Can the Son of Man forgive sins? Why is it that you're trying to put me in a box? Why is it that you're trying to put me in a template or a cookie cutter to where you can figure me out? You're not going to be able to figure me out. My ways are above your ways. My thoughts are above your thoughts. You're not going to figure this out because the, sin, the minute you have it figured out, you'll try to duplicate it and replicate it. And, it, and I don't work by cloning. I work by birthing. Amen. I work through life. Life begets life. Right? So you have to catch the heart of this thing more though than the formula of this thing. And I'll have to admit and confess to you, there was many times, a bit of many times in my walk that I have bent more and leaned more and depended more on what I knew was a formula than I did the actual person of Jesus. And maybe you're all more holy than I am and that doesn't happen to you, but it certainly has happened to me. Even in my prayers, I have been conditioned in my prayers at times to even pray like I've always prayed or I've heard somebody else pray, right? I'm gonna give you an example. Jesus didn't look at him and say, hey, I need you to repeat this back after me. Romans 10, 9, and 10. There's nothing wrong with Romans 10, 9. I'm not down in Romans 10, 9, and 10. I'm just telling you, the heart of the matter goes deeper than Romans 10, 9, and 10. Romans 10, 9, and 10 wasn't written when this happened. Right? So I want you to catch the heart of this thing rather than the legalistic approach. Because we can become legalistic about the good things and lose the power. We can take the intent of God, package it, and lose the intent of it. And the power. In the package. Right? Would we all agree that we should be seeing more results in lives than we've had seen up to this point? Would everybody agree with that? Yeah. Right? Okay? We've seen some great things happen. We've seen some incredible miracles. But when we have some setbacks and things happen, we go, ooh. And, 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 it, and, I, and, I, and I don't want to hear another message. And if I ever preach one, you guys throw something at me right in the middle of the sermon. I don't care. We don't, we're not preaching another legalistic, dogmatic approach of getting your life right because life comes right when you have a relationship with him. Amen. But you're not going to get your life right to get a relationship with him. Amen. And if we're always measuring people's life based on it being right, we're all in trouble. Yeah. We'll just all visit your house one evening. <laughs> right? We'll see how you talk to your kids. Right? It's just the way it is. So what I'm trying to get us to see tonight is I want us to see the heart of what God is doing and what God is saying and I know we've, we've had, there's nothing wrong with the way we've been taught. I'm just saying there's, there's a deeper, there's a greater revelation that I think that he's trying to get to us by the power of the Holy Spirit for the season and time that we're living right now. Can I say that and be okay with that? That was gentle enough, wasn't it? Right? He looks at the man and says, your sins are forgiven. The man never asked for his sins to be forgiven. So why isn't that a New Testament 2019 approach in the church today? I'm not asking for answers. These are rhetorical for you to go home and study, right? Why, why does that not happen today? Jesus did it. Well, that's Jesus. Well, we're in his stead today. We're here in his, on his behalf. We represent and represent him. Right? I, he's not going to come down here. And I told you guys the story about that suicide I preached. I'm telling you, he's not coming down here and doing it for us. No, it's you. It's me. And either we believe the power of the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us or he's outside of us that we're trying to tap into. You, you have the measure, the fullness of God dwells inside of every believer that's a believer. Can we establish that? The Spirit of God dwells in you. The God that created the universe is inside of you. Yes. Would we agree with that? Yes. Amen? How do we then mature the Christ in you? Paul said it this way. I am travailing like a mother travails giving birth that Christ be formed in you to believers. 
I'm going to confess to you or profess to you or get you to think about that we are carrying Christ inside of us that has not been fully developed into maturity in our lives, right? Would we agree with that, right? But we're carrying him. How we mature him is by revelation, understanding, knowledge that grows up him, grows him up inside of us to the fullness of the stature of the maturity of what Christ desired to be. It's in three phases. It's infancy, it's toddler, toddler, adolescence, 12 year old. There's three references of Jesus in the Bible. Infant, 12, teenage years, 30. Priesthood, adulthood, three references. There's three developments of a Christian walk. It's infancy, it is teenage years, and it's your adulthood. I believe that we're walking into a place where we're coming from teenage years into adulthood, to the fullness of the maturity of Christ. The world is waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God, the fullness of God, right? The world's waiting on it. We're waiting on it. The challenge is that we're waiting on it to happen out there and something to provoke us to become it. I'm telling you by revelation, it's going to develop in you. Am I making any sense? He said, your sins are forgiven. The man never asking for sins forgiven, right? You're going to have to deal with that. I'm going to have to deal with that. Park it. Put it in the parking lot. We're going to have to come back to it. Is that all right? Let's park it for a minute. He said it. It doesn't fit with Romans 10, 9, and 10. It doesn't fit for a man not asking for it. Right? That's a problem. That's an issue. We've got to reconcile that. Let's park it. Next scripture says, is it easier for a man or can a man not forgive sins and heal a person? Well, we're okay with you healing somebody. We just can't handle the fact that you're saying you're like God. That's a problem for us. Jesus had no problem saying I'm the son of God. Me and my father are one. Had no problem saying that, right? The very next scripture, he says, but you may have, but that you may know that the son of man has the power on earth. Now this is not, on, this is not in heaven. It's on earth. To forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, next verse, first love, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. The man Jesus never got him out of the bed. He told the man to pick it up. On the Sabbath day. Immediately he rose up, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of all that. Now here's the challenge, guys. There was no way to get the man in. How in the world did he get out? Carrying a bed. Didn't say he went back through the roof. How did he get out? Because people got out of the way. When this was all going on, people had to get out of the way for him to get out. He did not care. And, and, he, and he went out in the presence of them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God. God got glory out of that man being healed. God takes no glory in our tr trials. He's not trying to hurt us. He's trying to heal us. Amen. Our view of God has to be a good one. He's a good father. Yeah. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I got to get into this. This is going to be a good year for us, 2019. We're going to tackle this stuff in the New Covenant real quick. And I'm going to backtrack coming after Easter. And we're going to tackle some of this stuff in the Old Testament. As how in the world does God kill all those people? And tell David to go kill all these people. Or Joseph to go do his thing. And we're sitting there going, he's a good, good father on a Sunday morning. And he does that. That's got to be reconciled. For real. There's something that's incomplete. And we can't take the word for it by somebody that has incomplete revelation anymore just because we've been taught that way when we're not seeing the fullness of the power of God working in the lives like we should be in the church. Right? So somebody's got to push on the envelope a little bit. We're going to do that. And when we don't have answers, we're going to say we don't have answers. Instead of make one up and default back to something that's a template that doesn't work anyway. Just so we can say we have it. We should have tenets of faith, and there should be about five more of them that just say empty numbers. We don't know. We're discovering. We're trying to figure it out. We're walking this thing out together. 
No, we got it all. We, what we do is we capsulize all of our tenets of faith so it all fits together. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe in the triune being. We believe, and we say all those things, but what, uh, what are we going to do about this? He didn't ask to have his sins forgiven, and Jesus forgave him anyway. But that's Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus is not here today in the flesh. You and I are. So all we can do is reference this to an old story where somebody's got to make out a living reality today. He said to the paralytic, take up your bed and walk. The guy walks out. Let's look at the next passage of the scripture here. Let's, verse 11. Take up your bed and walk. He, he goes out of that, go to your house. Verse 12 says this. Immediately he rose, took up his bed and went out of the presence of them all. They were all amazed, glorified God. Listen, they say unto themselves, we never saw anything like this. How much in your Christian walk, since you've been saved, whether it be recently or maybe you've been saved for a long time, how much of it have you, can, can you say, we never saw anything like this? I know me, I can only write it down probably on a, just a, on, on, on a handful or a post-it note of things that I've never saw, I've never seen anything like this. You all? Do I have a string of things? You go, well, I got a whole list of things I've never seen anything like before. I, not me. I've seen a post-it. I'm ready to have a string. I want to see people get healed. I want to get, I want to get people delivered. I want to see people saved. I want to see people prosperous. I want to see the promises of the new covenant. I want to see Jesus get the rewards of all his suffering. Yeah. And you and I are it. Amen. So how do we reconcile this? We park it for a moment. Now let's go to John. John chapter 4, verse 46. John chapter 4, verse 46 through 54. John 4, 46. I'm gonna show you a common thread if I can get through all these tonight. There is a common thread. We'll build on the common thread and then we'll leave some other things to mystery. So Jesus came again to, the, to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. This is where he did his first miracle. So he's coming back to his first miracle. So there's already history and a testimony of him there. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judah into Galilee, he went to him implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Now, Jesus just got through telling the guy, listen, you all ain't gonna believe until you see miracles anyway. And the man disregarded what Jesus said. I don't really care about what you just said. I appreciate you trying to teach me a lesson right now, but I got a sick kid that's dying. That's the most important thing to me, right? Common thread, passion in the four men bringing the, taking off the roof. I don't care what people think. I don't care what the, the, the theology is. I don't care what their doctrine is. Get me to the man, Amen. right? Here's another thread. This thread is all the way in the second story. Go your way, we'll go back to verse 50. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. So the, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way without seeing any signs. Now, pause. I made it a doctrine when I read that two years ago. So what I do is, okay, I ask him for it. I have to believe him for it. Now I gotta begin to thank him for it because if I ask him again, I'm really not in faith. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So I ask, I, I pray, I believe, I thank him, and then, just to be honest, you grit your teeth until you see something to change. Right? Because you don't want to be in an unbelief and out of faith. Right? We're missing the point. The man never cared what Jesus was saying about your spirit. I know it's a lesson, Lord. You're teaching us a lesson about signs and miracles. I appreciate you saying that. I still got a sick kid. That's all that matters to me right now. I want to bypass all of this stuff. I got to get to the heart of the matter. I got to get to you. And you're the man. You got to make this happen. So the son of man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. Next verse, watch this. And as he now was now going down, his servants met him and told him and saying, whoa, your son lives. Now, just stop for just a sec. 
you're a mom and a dad in here probably. If you're not, you have aunts, you have nieces and nephews, you have people that you're close to with kids. You had people that are close to you that are, have been sick. Can you imagine the father of this mate, the son asked Jesus that, left there to go back to see what ha- if his son lives and has to walk that direction? You know what kind of torment? We, we, we make the story like he got the word, heard it from Jesus and went away, went, thanks Lord, high five, I'm going back home. I don't know anybody that way. I'm gonna be a nervous wreck. In fact, today we got text messages. We're probably texting home before we leave Jesus. Going, is he all right? I go, you, I got you. I had to, it's hard to get in front of you, Lord. I'm not leaving here until he's healed. You see what I'm saying? He leaves. The guy says, your son liveth. Then he inquired of them. Why did he inquire of them when he got better? Because he needed confirmation. He was still, after the kid was living, he still was curious. This how, when did he get better? And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever, yesterday means that man had to live a whole day wondering if he was going to. Am I making any sense? I'm trying to get us, this is our lives too. Your kid's got a fever. Your kid's sick. Your kid's got an issue. Somebody you know you're praying for that you've got a burden for. Something is wrong and it's not right. And you've petitioned and asked God for it. If you're like me, you're going to worry. And then some preacher like me is going to come by and say, cast your cares upon him, and we're going to have a problem because it's not that easy. You know what I'm saying? This has got to become a real thing, tangible life, real life, not just some, some, some out there, somebody giving you some great tips to live. But this is not the Oz show or Dr. Oz or Oprah and all these other things. On t- We've got so conditioned with learning all about it, we forgot how to live in it. Right? He had to wait a day. He asked, when did this happen? Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed. Whoa. It didn't say he believed back in verse 46 when he asked. The man never believed, didn't believe, and his whole household didn't believe until the miracle happened. I don't know about you, but I'm about pressed out with having to prove my belief to get a result. Right? You don't like this, do you? This is coming against everything. I know, I know it's pushing, I'm pushing as hard as I can push and I feel like I'm getting shoved myself bad. But the reality of it is, I don't, I'm tired of living this posture of, of tenseness and, 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 and concern and worry, I'm ready just to let it all go and just have this relationship with him going, this has got to get fixed. <laughs> Y'all looking at me like a deer in headlights. <laughs> the light's too bright or something. I don't know. I'm ready. Are you all ready for this? Ready. This has got to come. Be, rubber's got to meet the road. I, I can't make any more excuses for somebody why they didn't happen to somebody. Why they didn't get healed and they didn't have enough faith or this didn't ha- or I didn't have enough faith or I don't know, it's worse as God's will for this to happen. I'm not saying everybody's gonna get a win the way we think a win should be. But I'm tired of accepting losses that should be wins. That's my point. And somehow we gotta cut through all this chase and mess that we've created for ourselves of theology flaws and all that stuff. And the Lord worked through all those theology flaws. What I'm trying to get to you tonight is, I don't care what theology or doctrine you're trying to work out, he still can work through all of that if you'll just become real. I don't care if your word of faith, if you're, uh, uh, whatever, what are some of those other, kingdom now, yesterday, tomorrow, whatever they say. I don't care if you're the church of God, if you're, I don't care what kind of background you have. That's not the issue. The issue is, do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? And can you cut through all that stuff just to be real enough for him to get to your heart so you can get to his heart? That's the key. That's everything. It's raw. It's, it's messy. It's not for public opinion. It's just not. Four guys take a roof off, right, to get to Jesus. And the guy got his sins forgiven. I just went to the parking lot, didn't I? Let me come back over here. So the father knew, and he himself believed, his whole household believed. Now, now he didn't go home, he didn't, hang on, he didn't, go, he didn't go home and say, listen, guys, I gotta tell you this. 
I know he's gonna be healed. We're gonna stand here all in faith and make sure this kid gets, his son gets healed. He got healed, the whole family. What do you think's gonna cause a lot of people to believe? He just told the man, unless you all see signs and miracles, you're not gonna believe. The man went home and did exactly what Jesus said, even though he disregarded what Jesus said to him. He can work through our stuff. Amen. You got a personality flaw, Jesus can work through it. You got a quirk, he can work through it. You're hyper, he can work through it. You're impatient, he can work through it. But what we do is we start working on our imperfections all the time, thinking that's gonna hinder God getting to you. I got news for you, he's bigger than those things. Amen. In fact, God will use those things. We're not trying to make perfect people, I want passionate people that, that chase the perfection of one. Him. Let's go to the next, it's, it's 8.02, I still got time, let's do this. John chapter five, verse one through 13. Y'all following? On the parking lot we have, the sins are forgiven and the man never asked for it. On the, well, we put, put this one in the parking lot too, the last one here, where the man didn't look like he had enough faith, he just went home. <laughs> here we go. After, there, after this, now we're, we just left John chapter 4. We're going into John chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down in a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him and said, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but I, while I'm coming and another steps down right in front of me. Jesus said to him, I heard what you said. Take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that the day, go back to verse seven, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this scripture to you the way I have preached to people for years. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. Let's go verse, verse six first. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Right? Next verse says, he never answered Jesus. He never answered, yeah, I want to be well. What I would have said to him, that man, the reason you haven't gotten your healing is because you're not confessing properly. Am I all right? He didn't say the right things. Jesus said, do you want to be made well? All he had to say is, yes, I want to be made well. He comes up with an excuse. So can God heal a person with an excuse? Did the man have to get his words right and his, everything right? No. Jesus looks at him and looks past his reasons and excuses and inhibitions. He looks past all that and, and the man says, sir, I have been here. All, I've got all, re there's a lot of reasons why I'm here. You just don't understand. Every time I try to get up, somebody comes down here. He was complaining. If I was Jesus, I'd be going, you don't understand. The word says, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you're saved. I need you to confess to me and believe with me that you're going to be healed. That's what I would have said to the guy. And he'd looked at me and he'd have said, I don't have anybody to get me in the water. I don't have, I've, I've been here for 30 years, I don't have anybody. Get, and I would have walked away. Maybe you wouldn't have, but I'd have walked away and I said, he just didn't have the faith. Look at him, he's, he's got to leave me in his condition. Jesus bypassed all of the excuses, moved past all the reasons. And he looked at him and said, sir, let's go back to verse eight. Jesus said, just rise up and take up your bed and walk. I'm not carrying your bed for you either. Get up and go. Go. Next verse. And immediately the man stopped, looked at Jesus and said, I haven't had, man, you're the first person in 38 years. No, he didn't say any of that. He immediately, the man was made well, took up his bed, st stopped, thanked Jesus, started paying tithes, 
prayed, asked for a new King James Bible because the King James wasn't available then. <laughs> right? She started reading. None of that. Are you following what I'm telling you? I know I'm being a little bit facetious and a little bit out here a little bit, but I'm, and I'm not exaggerating. I want you to see what we have done to people. I want to see where we are. That's been done to us. Self-induced. I've done it to myself. Got myself so twisted in theology that I forgot the man of the theology. Jesus is perfect theology. And you can't go wrong when you get him because there's no formula. There's passion. There's relationship. Immediately the man took up his bed and walked. And here's another problem. It was on the Sabbath day. Next verse. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, they did, the man, this man sit there 38 years. These people knew him. Nobody acknowledged that he was healed. They acknowledged he was breaking the law. You, you come outside, you broke the template. It's better that you stay there until the angel comes down and beats, you better beat somebody inside that pool. Because I know this guy just healed you, but you just broke the rule. Are, are you following what I'm trying to say? I know I'm making it a little bit simple in light of this, but the reality of this, we do that every day. We may not say, it's the Sabbath. What are you doing carrying? We would say it this way. You didn't, you, where's, your, where's your faith? You know, what, where's your right living? And I'm all about right living. I'm all about holiness. You'll see that down the road. I'll preach that. It's going to be entwined in all this stuff too. I'm about holiness. Not everything goes. I'm just not about that, okay? But I'm not about that to get the end result and not still know Jesus. Because you can be, you, a person can live blameless life and never know him. I know him. I know good moral people that are more moral than some Christian people that I know. You don't need to be Christian to be moral. When you become Christian, you should become moral. Right? I'm not telling you to be perfect, but you better be looking for whole, that, that stuff has to become a part of your life because the, the relationship transforms you into him, into his image. Not to try to imitate him, to become him because he's in you. They should be able to look at you and say, when's the last time somebody looked at you and said, man, you're blaspheming God? No, you know why? Because we keep a clear separation. My identity, his identity, and occasionally on, 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 on convenience, I fuse this together. Oh, that will preach. It's me, it's him, and then we fuse at convenient times. Right? When's the last time somebody said to you, Man, you blaspheme the Lord. No, today's blaspheme is you say something bad about somebody or you, you cuss or you, in some churches I grew up, you wore, wore, wore pants. That's blasphemy, right? And we made it some external thing. No, Jesus was constantly be called, it was called a blasphemer. What about you? What about me? When's the last time? Parking lot. I got three things in the parking lot right now, Right? The Sabbath, we gotta, we gotta deal with this. We gotta deal with the fact that the man had all these reasons not. And Jesus bypassed his excuses, ignored those excuses, and told the man to pick up his bed and walk. Right? No formula. In fact, the two we just read in John 4 and John 5, both of them, Jesus said something to him. It was like they were having two different conversations. They did not fire off on all cylinder. Jesus said something, he said something back, and we're going, there's are two different conversations, right? And he bypassed that to get the end result. Why? So he could be glorified. He doesn't get glorified in you getting the formula right. He gets glorified when he gets the fruit and the reward of his suffering. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Verse 11, he answered them, he who made me well said to me, this is the Pharisees. This is the Pharisee. Or the, saying to him, the Jews, saying, you can't do this. Here, here's a problem. How do you tell somebody that's had an encounter with Jesus to undo what they just had? The man couldn't get back in, 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 in compliance with the law if he wanted to. He's carrying his bed. He couldn't say, oh God, I need to repent and forget about that. What do I do now? No, he's healed. You think the man cared about that? Here's what he said. 
He who, who's he? He who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Verse 12. Then they asked him, who is this man who said, take up your bed? But the one who was healed in the parking lot, he did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Next verse. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have made me well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that two verses later, he runs into the same Jews and says, I don't know who it was, thir verse 13, who healed me, but I had an encounter with him, and in 15, I can tell you it was the one you thought it was. How does that fit? He had an encounter with Jesus at a pool. He says, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. The man never even knew that was Jesus. How does that fit our theology? Oh, that's just Jesus. Jesus isn't here today in the flesh. We are his flesh. Amen. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. This, is, this is important. See, the Gospels are more than just a, a movie. They're a reality for us today. Yes. Amen. Let me go to one more. Then I'm going to try to tie all this together if I can. John chapter 9, 1. Well, let's do John chapter 8 first. John chapter 8. I'll do one more, and I've got two, but I can do them next week. John chapter 8, verse 3 through 11. Is this helping anybody? Is this confusing all of us? Well, shoot, I was trying to for, for a moment anyway. John chapter 8, let's just go to that verse. And here I'll tie, I will tie this together, because I'm going to give you a scripture that's going to, I want us to challenge us, and we're going to push on this for another week or so. John chapter 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people that came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought him a woman that was caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. First, go back a little bit. But what do you say? They said to him, they said to him teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. He really repeated himself. Verse 5. Now Moses, now they're going to give him a reason. Okay? They're going to give him a validation that he can use because they're not coming to him just in their own preference. These people are coming to him as protectors of that church that we knew about back then. Okay, these are church folk. These are Jewish people. These are religious people. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up, said to, the, said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, here's what I want to stop. We'll go back for one second. Go back for Go and sin no more. He's not saying to her, I'm getting, letting you go so you get another, here's another shot at it for you. He's not giving her another, another chance. That's not what he's doing. He's telling her, there's only one here that's without sin that can sh throw a stone and be legal. It's me. I can condemn you and I can accuse you and I can condemn you down to the core because you got caught in the act. I legally can do that. I'm choosing not to. I would rather give you mercy than give you judgment. That's what he's telling her. And because she came in contact with the grace and mercy of God, it should be compelling enough to her to have an encounter with that love because the greatest accuser could have accused her and condemned her. 
So what he said to her was, neither do I condemn you. Go and live free. Romans does say in chapter 8, therefore there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Therefore live in the spirit, not after the flesh. That's a living example of that scripture. You're coming in contact with condemnation. I choose not to condemn you. Don't take the condemnation. Walk away. Now live free. Not free to sin, because if she truly had an encounter with him, it would cause her to live right. Are you following me? Not, here's another shot at it. Hope it works out for you. Here, I, I got, you got free from this one. Now you better not go out and do it again. No, no, no. When you come in contact with him and he chooses not to condemn you, it should be such a lifting off of your shoulders that you walk away going, I just had an encounter with love. And love compels me to do good, not to get away with stuff. Are you following what I'm saying? It's important. Let me give you an example. And I've said this before. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this again. I, I, this is one of my favorite stories, and I'm gonna end with this. And then I've gotta go back to the parking lot for just a second. I, you, I got, you gotta get this. And I remember a guy, and I think I told this not too long ago, but it, I have to say it again. It was a guy that was coming up to me and was just badgering me years ago about his relation. His, his, we were talking about the grace of God, and I believe the grace of God transforms a person. It's not a license to sin. It's a license from sin. Okay? You don't, it just doesn't give you permission to do what you want to do. It just doesn't. And people that say that, are, they don't know grace. So the guy was telling me, you're, you're giving people license to sin. I said, they don't need a license to sin. They're sinning already. They don't, call, they don't need to call it license. People just sin. They do. Nobody's calling me up on the phone and saying, hey, can I do this? No. He was badgering me. Just badgering me. You're just, that's wrong. That's wrong. And I said, I'm just preaching the love of God has the ability and power to change people. And uh, you guys remember this story. Some of you probably did. He was sitting at the funeral home one night. Or we were at the funeral and his wife was sitting behind him. And I was looking at him and he was just going hard at me. And finally, I said, God, I don't want to debate this guy and argue this guy all night long. I'm at a funeral. I don't want to do this. And he looked at me and he said, he said, yeah, he said, what you're pre preaching, that's wrong. You're giving people license to sin. I said, God, no, you don't even know. And finally, I said, God, I need wisdom. I, need a, I don't need to argue and debate. I need wisdom. And finally, his wife was leaning over his chair behind him, just like those chairs like that. You'd be sitting in the second row. She was sitting in the second row. I was sitting across from him. And she was leaning over. I said, you know, your wife is just incredible. You got a great wife. He said, yeah, I do. I said, she's so incredible that, you know, she, she waits around here for church. I said, and she kind of puts up with you. And he laughed. And I said, she's a wonderful lady. Yeah, yeah, she is. I said, and you really did well when you married her because she is an incredible woman inside and out. He goes, oh, God, yeah, she is. She really. He's looking at her now, tears coming to his eyes. I said, you're just a, she's just a wonderful lady. I said, I think she worships the ground you walk on. And he went, yeah, yeah. yeah. And she's smiling back there just like that. And I'm looking at her, looking at him, and I said, this is wonderful. And he says, yeah, I, said, I, said, I think she does. I said, she waits around, you're the last person to leave, and she's just right here walking out with you, and she's just happy to be your wife. And he said, yeah. And I mean, but this time, tears were really coming on his face. And I said, and I think if you had an affair on her, I think she would forgive you and take you back. And he went, he looked at me, yeah, I believe you're right. I said, then why don't you do it? And he went, oh, that's why you don't do it. I said, that's grace. That's grace. Because when something hits you and some love that you have that compels, it compels you to do right. I said, I didn't say another word other than that's grace. Knocked the breath out of him when I said it, and I got up and walked off. Left him thinking. Why? What I'm telling you is, when you come and encounter with God, she came and encounter with Jesus. She wasn't looking for license to do wrong. That love from God compels you to do right. Amen. Or you didn't have an encounter. You feel undone when you're with him, but he makes you feel done. You feel worthless when, when, when you're in front of him, but he makes you feel worthy. Somehow he picks you up and turns you around and makes it all right. Now that doesn't fit in the natural world of church world. Because we're measuring sins in people. And we've all sinned and come short of the glory, right? But there's something inside of us that compels us. We want to raise our kids to have an encounter and to know the Lord. Yeah. Not to know about him. 
to know him, to experience him, to know him in a way that nobody can take it away from you when you're in trouble in times. Making sense? No, but no. If a kid comes up to me and says, I want, I, 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 you know, I'm ready to receive Jesus into my heart, we're going to receive you. If, if the kid's there, we're going to pray with him, right? But the fact that the kid said, I'm ready to receive Jesus in my heart, there's a good chance Jesus is already in his heart. Amen. Right? But what we'll do, and there's nothing wrong with this, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. We'll pray with him and have that prayer because the, that makes it secure in us. We get the confidence in closing the deal. Listen, that's not how this works. God is doing things in the heart of people that we can't measure. And when we would get off the measuring stick holder and start just loving people, relationship with people, caring for people, when we're in relationship with them, we'll take the good and the bad. I've got people in my life that I've got some friends that say, I can't believe you're friends with them. I love those people. Oh my God, I'm passionate about them. You wouldn't believe. They'll never step foot in the church. You know, I want them to, but if they never do, it's not going to make me love them any less. I'll still take their call. I'll still text them back at 2 o'clock in the morning. Right? Why? Because I love them. And I am the only representation that they're ever going to find of him. He, they can't, this guy can't be laying in his bed at 2 o'clock at night, tears rolling down his face, feeling depressed, like he's going to kill himself. His life's falling apart. Everybody's left him. He's feeling alone, isolated. He texts me on the phone, and I say, let me pray for you. I'll pray for you. But what he needs is more than a prayer for me is he needs me. Why? Because I am the man in the stead of Jesus. And until we take the place in the earth, and take the risk, we're not going to see the results that we want to see. You're not going to see the transformation. And the biggest scare or worry we're having, I don't want to get over to heresy. We're not getting into heresy. We're getting into relationship. When you get into relationship, it gets messy. It gets ugly sometimes. But we're in it. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? This is critical. I'm tired of getting preached at. How about we preach it together and live it together? How about we learn together, discover him together? And, when, and I told a guy this the other day. He came to me and said, man, I, I just, I want, us, I want all of Jesus I can get. I stuck my hands out. He said, you want to pray? I said, no. You get me. I said, I don't know how to give you him, but I know how to give you me. I don't know how to give you him. I, I don't know how to duplicate him. I don't think he's expecting us to be duplicated. I think he wants to live through us. I said, I don't know how to do that, but I can give you me. That's as close as I can get. I can take what he's done for me. He's changed my life. He's turned it upside down at times. He makes it a mystery at times. There's questions I have I don't get answers for. I've, I've had some losses that I thought should be wins. And the guy's going, man, I can relate to all that. I go, that's what he said. If you can't touch, he is our high priest that can be touched. And if you can't be touched, you can't be a representation of the high priest. You don't have to have the answers you are the walking example and answer. Listen, I'm going to go here. Real quick, i got to close. The children are going to get loose in a minute. The nursery will release these kids. They'll run everywhere. I know. That's how they do me. I don't need a clock. I just got a release back there. And then they, then they say the Lord was moving. Um, <laughs> he probably was. Um, Philippians chapter 2. Now, I want to leave you with this. And then next week, we're going to go a little further if you all come, if you all come back. If you don't, you'll wonder. I don't mean wander either. You'll wonder. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love. This is about love, guys. Being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem, oh God, I could go here forever, esteem others better than themselves. This is not a, this is about people. Next verse. Let us each look out not only for our own interests, or only for his interests, but also for the interests of others. Here we go. You're going to have to reconcile this. Let this mind be in you, 
Say your name in you. Let this mind be in you. Say your name, Kevin. This mind be in Kevin, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You, I, we have got to be the representation. Everybody tells you, you've got to put on the mind of Christ. Put on the mind of Christ what? To live right? No. Putting on the mind of Christ says he found it not robbery to find himself equal with God. Now, if you look that up in the Greek, what it means is to find himself a son of God. He did not find it robbery to say to people, I'm the son of God. I'm his son. Me and my father are one. Now, it says you and your father are one. Go back to my thing. It's us, Jesus, and a common, every now and then we'll fuse ourselves together. Listen, you want the mind of Christ? You better accept who you think, who he made you to be. You better put on the mind of Christ by accepting, I am the son of God. Now, you're not Jesus, but because he dwells in you, he flows through you, he's your elder brother. Your heirs of God join heirs with Jesus Christ. That, that sounds so good when we're on a preaching riff, right? And, we're, and the band's playing behind us. We're going, oh, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. We're, 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 we are join heirs with Jesus Christ. Everybody's going, yeah, we are. And one day we're going to get it. That's not what this says. He found it not robbery. He made himself. And here's the question. Can you be a son of God and still find yourself in no reputation? If you can, you're humble. The people, the world will think it's you. You're going to know it's him. And in your quiet time, you're going to go, God, I could not do the things that I do and be the things that I am if it wasn't for you. He found it not robbery when God called him a son of God. He accepted who God called him to be. I'm asking you tonight, are you accepting who God called you to be? We got a lot of things on the parking lot. We're going to leave them there till next week. We got to answer those questions. But I'm going to answer, ask you this. If you're seeing all the results you want to see in your Christian walk, just keep doing what you're doing. Right? I, I commend you. Write it down. We'll make a book out of it. There'll be several of us that buy it because we'll try to imitate it. It's the truth. Right? It'll happen. I had a, and I got to close, but I had a lunch one time with Bishop Jake. So it was in Dallas, Texas, and we had a friend of mine were there, and we were just about eight of us sitting at a table eating lunch. And I was listening to him, and he, uh, he said one of the most profound things that stuck with me in my whole life, and I've never been able to reconcile it until the last, probably the last four or five years. He said, I've learned a whole lot of what it's not, and I'm starting to learn on what it is. And the guy on the other side of the table said, what is it? He said, it's him. It's all about him. And he said, you can put everything else to fall away, but he will remain forever. And that has stuck with me. In the last four or five years, it's becoming a reality because I'm seeing it. I'm learning it. I'm discovering it. And he and I have a relationship, like you all have a relationship with him. We have a relationship. We do. And we're going somewhere. But I'm telling you, it is built on the foundation of love. Not superficial love, not interactive love, not, not selfish, conditional love, but love. We're in this thing together. Would you all stand with me? I got a week or two left of this, if you'll hang with me. I promise you it'll make sense more in the next couple of weeks. Let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you, Lord, for everybody that came out tonight, everybody that's watching by way of uh, internet and, or Facebook or however they're watching. I, I just thank you, Lord, that you're just opening up the scriptures to us. You said this, and I'm, I'm banking on this. You said on the road to Emmaus, when you opened and started speaking the scriptures to those two guys that didn't know who you were, that were talking to you, 
you open, you start speaking of yourself all the way from Moses all the way to that day. The Bible says you open up their eyes and their hearts said, they said in their mind, their hearts were burning within this, within them. I'm asking that let the scriptures open up, the scriptures that speak of you, open up that causes our hearts to burn within us. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you all.